Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Crit and Crit. I'm Sint. I'm Axion. And we are continuing our discussion of Dracula and our playthrough of Castlevania Circle of the Moon. I think it's time we discuss something called a walk on the wild side. Or, more accurately, um, the effect of Oscar Wilde on Bram Stoker as, an, uh, as a person and resultantly as an author. Axion, what's your um, knowledge of uh, Oscar Wilde? He existed. Okay, fair. <laughs> That's it. I couldn't tell you what he wrote, I couldn't tell you what he was known for, and until we started doing research from this for this episode, he was just one of those people around Bram Stoker's time who wrote things. See, I do know for a fact you have read something based on an Oscar Wilde play. Okay. A Civil Campaign by Lois McMaster Bejold is ba is basically uh, an ideal husband, but in space. Gotcha. But yeah, so Oscar Wilde is a very well-known Irish playwright. Um, he wrote one novel, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, which has its own controversies Wait, around it. Dorian Gray? Yeah. I did not know that. I have read Dorian Gray. I did not know he wrote it. Yep, so that's the only novel he wrote. Um, it was very controversial at the time. Uh, still is to some extent today for uh, reasons we'll talk about. Um, but he's better known for his plays, Lady Windermere's Fan, uh, An Ideal Husband, The Importance of Being Earnest, and I think there's one more I'm missing offhand, but I've only read the latter two. I haven't read Lady Windermere. But, yeah, those are incredibly witty. Like, um, when we read um, Ernest in my uh, AP Lit class in high school, um, my teacher actually compared Oscar Wilde to Airplane. If you don't get the first joke, it's okay, three more are already on the way. Is, like, Oscar Wilde in that sense is the opposite of Shakespeare, whereas in Shakespeare you have to sit there and actually read it to see all the jokes, or see it perform to see all the jokes. Um, Wild, you can't just watch it because you'll miss half the jokes while you're reacting to the first ones. So, he was an incredibly witty man, and that's made him very popular around society. And he was also a very flamboyant figure, which is uh, how we're going to be looking at his relations, uh, relationship to Bram Stoker, just as people. Oh boy, this is going to be a rabbit hole. So, Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde knew each other as children. Their families were closely acquainted, and they were very familiar with each other. They even pursued the same romantic interest for a while. A woman by the name of... Florence Balcom, who is... She was a writer and historian of her own right, but is best known in the modern era as being Stoker's uh, executor and the handler of his works post-mortem. Then for, unfortunately, for anything she did of her own... Which is, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind being known as a Pokemon. Har har. That's not what I meant, Exec though. Executor, I know. But puns are what I do. Did I already go this way? I remember fighting the werewolves. Anyway, um... She earned her modern reputation mostly because as the executor of Stoker's Possessions, she took the creators of the German film Nosferatu to court for basically making the movie based very, very heavily on Dracula with zero credit and zero money to her or to 
Ah, yes, I have been here already. To her or to uh, her husband's estate. And uh, at the time, she was not doing so well financially and could really have used that money. So, yeah. On the notes you have, you've mentioned that Wilde regularly mentions in his memoirs that he and Stoker were childhood friends, but Stoker does not, and I wonder, given the benefit of hindsight, if that was edited out of uh, Stoker's memoirs. It may well have been, but that draws us to the reason that such an edit would have been made, or it's just as likely, for reasons that we will get to shortly, that Stoker removed the references himself. All right. Or chose not to make them himself, one or the other. Yeah. So, Oscar Wilde um, is basically the reason we have the stereotype of the flamboyant homosexual man today. Because, um, well, he was. Oscar Wilde was a very public figure. Um, he, at the very least, he was, he was bisexual, because he was married to a woman, but he what did actually go to court for um, indecency, which was the charge of uh, same-sex relations at the time. So, he did go spend time in jail for that, and never really was able to pick up his career after that, and died of meningitis not long after. But, in an era where such behavior is illegal, for whatever stupid reason, um, being associated with such a figure invites questioning. So if you were somebody who uh, grew up very close to Oscar Wilde and were also something of a public literary figure, you might also come under that scrutiny. Isn't that right, Mr. Stoker? And much of this culminated in that trial that Sin just mentioned. When Wilde went on trial, many of his prior acquaintances were looked on with more suspicion, brought in for their own questioning, or faced social or public backlash as a result. And I may be missing some information, but from how I understand it, while homosexuality was on the books illegal at the time, there was kind of a social understanding. It wasn't talked about in public. It was not a thing to be made public. But it was a thing that happened. Veiled references to it were not uncommon. And you just didn't talk about it. And I think that's actually what happened. Um, Wilde went to trial because he first sued um, the Marquess of Queensbury over um, libel because of uh, something uh, Queensbury had said. So Wilde automatically put himself in the public eye. I should note, um, I don't, I'm not as clear on the details as I, li as I should be, I'm sorry. Um, Wilde's um, lover was uh, one of Queensbury's uh, relatives, I want to say son. I, I want to say uh, Bozy, but yeah. So Wilde kind of invited uh, Queensbury to retaliate. So while it wasn't something that was widely talked about, Wilde kind of forced that issue, and it backfired horribly. Not really an my excuse, of, but... Yeah, so that's my rudimentary understanding. As long as it wasn't something that was brought into the public eye, it could be ignored. But it was brought into the public eye, and the public, being the uh, registered trademark moral guardians, had to do something about it. Wild's trial, and the very public spectacle it put upon him as 
either a gay man or a bisexual man caught in a gay relationship. Whichever. Both. Whatever. Whatever the situation was, it changed the way male homosexuality was treated in the culture at the time. It went from being this thing that, oh well, it happens, to no, this is not acceptable, no exceptions, this is intolerable. No longer did this be... No longer was this a thing that some men who just did before they got married. It became socially, culturally, completely unacceptable. Right. So, how does this affect Dracula, since that's primarily what we're here to discuss? Well, as we stated, Stoker was affiliated with Oscar Wilde. Furthermore, Stoker moved in many of the same circles that Wilde did that came under fire after his sexuality became public knowledge. Particularly his association with Walt Whitman and Henry Irving. Uh, Whitman was another writer uh, who himself had non-straight sexual relationships, uh, including with Wilde, theoretically, or presumably, rather. Uh, obviously, it's, it's difficult to prove definitively some of these things, but we have good reason to believe, based on some of his and Wilde's writings to each other, as well as some of the contents of their work. Irving was an actor who also had some uh, similar inclinations and uh, incidents of being investigated for such. And uh, he and Stoker were extremely close. They were business partners. Uh, Stoker is recorded as having been very uh, impressed and uh, admiring, admiring of Irving uh, to the point where others mention in their own writings that Irving was seen as somewhat of a uh, manipulator and a very controlling man and that uh, Stoker basically did whatever Irving wanted him to do. Alright, so that definitely says how uh, Stoker himself was impacted. Yeah, I was, I was gonna continue. <laughs> okay, sorry. So that brings us to Dracula. If one wished to make a queer reading of Dracula, it is remarkably easy. And part of that brings us to Irving, which is one of the reasons why I went on that long tirade about Stoker before I went into talking about the book proper. Stoker reported in several writings, as well as the writings of his wife and of others who collaborated with him, that he based a lot of Dracula on on Henry Irving. A lot of his personality, a lot of his mannerisms, and a lot of his flamboyance were based on Irving as a person with, of course, a bit of a fantastical flair. Furthermore, it is child's play to read Dracula as a gay or bisexual character. Allow me a short list. <laughs> uh, and as I consult my notes. One, 
almost all of Dracula's relationships that are not purely prey are male to male. Dracula is possessive, controlling, and immensely influential over Harker. And he is adored and practically worshipped by Renfield. In a way that could be easily read, if one wished to, as a man with homosexual inclinations who is also inclined to be very manipulative towards his partners and would be paramours. By contrast, the few male-to-female relationships in the book, which are strictly limited to Mina and Harker, and to uh, the three gentlemen pursuing Lucy, are essentially sexless. And I kind of wonder how much of that is just due to the um, often transactional nature of marriages in that era. Especially if you're of a certain class, you had to find an appropriate match, not just one that you had strong emotional feelings for. Which so, could be very much the case. But yeah. to continue this with a this is this is this is a reading. This is a deliberate interpretation. Yeah. Um. Mina and Harker are more like co-workers than like husband and wife in a lot of ways. And to some degree, the text even highlights this. Mina laughs at the idea of the modern independent woman and while she, as we discussed in a prior episode, partakes of jobs and duties that would could possibly be associated with a less homemaker woman, uh, she does them solely for the benefit of her husband. Will you per permit me a stupid sidetrack here? Go ahead. Oh my god, they were co-workers. <laughs> Um, furthermore, Mina is described as having the mind of a man and the heart of a woman. And this is, this is said as a compliment and as a reason for why the other gentlemen work so well with her in investigating Dracula, where... Traditionally, a woman would be expected to remain in the home and not go gallivanting around the countryside hunting vampires. One, one could read this if they wish to... For the love of Pete with the bombs again! Uh, one, if one wished to read this... Uh, as an implication of homosexuality, one could take this as Mina being coded as male in almost every way possible, but depicted as a woman because Harker being in a romantic relationship with another man was unacceptable. And that potential of a relationship with Dracula being depicted as something to be avoided, something evil and monstrous and fearful. Ah, there is a door here that I cannot find. Oh, it's down that way. I went the wrong way, that's why. Bum, bum. But... Stupid ghosts. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, this way. <laughs> ah, yes, there's the other demon. These guys were in here power. before. <laughs> so, um... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing you standing there in one place and swimming my around, I'm just thinking, TRAITOR! Whappy, 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 whappy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, jumping back to Dracula, Dracula has no prominent relationships with any woman that aren't purely prey. He... He does not acknowledge Lucy in any way other than feeding on her and transforming her into a vampire. He only treats Mina as something more when she becomes a threat to him because of how she is aiding the men. And the female vampires are essentially pets that he keeps in a, in, locked in a room and feeds them the men he's done with. And until he is finished with them, they are to stay away from his property. He seems to have no actual personal interest in interacting with women they are solely a food source. And pets to be kept for the purposes of entertainment and whatever else the brides are used for. Taking care of discarded lovers, I guess. Yeah, and again, there, you could look at this in more like economic terms, which is also basically a gendered reading of uh, what does it say about Dracula that this is how he sees women? Is it just because they don't have much standing in society, so what use are they to him? Or do we want to stick with uh, the interpretation of uh, Dracula as an LGBT figure? I'm mostly looking at that because that's relevant to the discussion about Stoker, yeah. but you could absolutely make a reading of it that is this is how Stoker looked at women and their position in society, as well as him looking at his own complicated feelings on sexuality. Yeah, honestly, when, when doing readings like this, I try to look at them as just like gender in general, because uh, definitely an aspect of a queer reading is just how are gender roles present, subverted, and how does that play out in terms of relationships and such like that, because, well, one of the major social pushbacks traditionally has been that homosexuality and same-sex relations um, are a subversion of expected and accepted gender norms. So it does benefit a reading like this to look at uh, ex ex expectations of gender as you're going through, but I think we have talked about that before. So, yep. yeah. So... This brings us to, in addition to everything else, to how Stoker himself wrote men and women, particularly in how he described them. Stoker is immensely detailed about everything about most of his male ma main characters, particularly Dracula, Harker, and Van Helsing. He describes their appearances to exacting details. He is extremely precise about how he writes their clothing, their posture, their mannerisms. Uh, he spe he pays special care to the way their dialect works, especially with ba Dracula and with Van Helsing. And this, of course, could also fall back on the uh, issue of xenophobia that we uh, mentioned in a prior episode, but you note he does not do this with any of the women, even the vampire brides. 
Furthermore, his descriptions of women in general are very simplistic. He describes Lucy solely as beautiful and describes her clothing with nothing more than the name of whatever article of clothing she happens to be wearing and possibly, and in some cases, the color. Compared to how he describes Dracula's clothing or Van Helsing's, it is noticeably simplistic. When he describes the features of the Vampire Brides, he is short, terse, and to the point. He only lingers on the third bride because she's white, and that's... Well, one, that's possibly a racist thing uh, to build on top of the xenophobia, and two, it's a point that makes her stand out because the other brides look local. Stoker writes women with the bare bones necessary for them to exist in the scene and nothing more, whereas he paints pictures of the men that he writes. This is a extremely noticeable difference in style. And it's extremely consistent throughout the book. Even Mina, the female character who gets the most attention from Stoker throughout the entire book, and has, in a lot of ways, a very masculine presentation by the author, is given far, far less time and detail in any descriptions that depict her. I keep going in circles. Yeah, that definitely is something to note as you, as you read, because it's really hard to miss that once you've started noticing it. And I can definitely see how that would contribute to a reading of this, especially given what we know of the historical and social context of Stoker's uh, personal life. Which is exactly where I was about to go next. So now that we have discussed the way he writes, the characters he writes, how he depicts them, and the differences between the genders, and the depictions of characters in the book, let's circle back to Stoker himself and the aftermath of the Wild Trial. And to how we looked at what happened to Wild before, during, and after his trial, and turn that on Stoker. Stoker was closely associated with Wilde in their younger years, childhood, early adulthood. They both were, for a time, involved with the same woman, and notably, Balcom had one child with Stoker, and according to her granddaughter who wrote her memoirs, their relationship was otherwise described as either sexless or anti-sexual. There was almost no intimate relationship between Stoker and Balcom after their first child was born. They fulfilled... Ah, here we are. They fulfilled their marital duty. And as far as anyone can tell, that is where the intimate portion of their relationship came to an end. Secondly, Stoker was, as we said earlier, highly involved in the same social circles as Wilde especially being involved with Wilde himself, 
with Henry Irving and with Walt Whitman. Men who all had associations with male homosexuality and male homosexual relationships, even if they might have been bi or pan or whatever the term we would use in the modern day would be, they would have been falling at this time under the same sort of scrutiny as Stoker and Wilde were. In the aftermath of Wilde's trial, Stoker changed as a person. He became more insular, and he became extremely authoritarian. He began advocating for extremely harsh punishments for homosexual behavior and extremely strict limitations on the interactions of men lest they be in such relationships by the government and other authority figures. One could read that action as him going hard in opposition to himself and others pursuing homosexual relationships in the wake of what happened to Wilde, especially as a way to veer suspicion and investigation off of himself. This is not an uncommon thing that happened at the time, and it's to some degree not an uncommon thing to happen today. People especially people in situations that they do not feel they can escape or that they are not in a position to escape will often force themselves harder back into the closet to avoid suspicion even to their own detriment because they think that is the way to stay safe and to keep suspicion off of them while others are looking to punish those involved in whatever is being persecuted at the time. I really don't want to fight you right now, Mr. Demon. I don't know if Mr. Demon's going to give you a choice on that. Well, I mean, I got off the map. <laughs> So, he's gone. At least until I go back to that map. Well, yeah, I think you've uh, covered this one pretty thoroughly, though. I, I have done some research. To add on top of all of this, Stoker died from syphilis. Which is a... What is the term that is, that is preferred by doctors nowadays for this? I believe it's STI now. STI. Uh, that was, at the time, known to be regularly transmitted between homosexual men. And, more importantly to this particular conversation, his wife did not have syphilis. So, where did he get it? Now, there, I'm sure there are answers someone could give that would be he, something other than he got it from a male partner who had it. I'm sure there are plenty of medical ways that he could have acquired the disease by some other means, but they're not the most likely reason. One could completely reasonably. I don't want to deal with you right now. I. Ah, I wanted a save point. Do I have healing items?
Well, that'll have to do. Uh, one could easily read the source of his death as at least a piece of evidence, if not outright proof, that he was likely involved with someone and unfortunately his partner had syphilis. He caught it and it ended up killing him. Alpha Mouth lived Stoker by several decades, and she died of old age. Not syphilis. So, that's just, I guess, one more question to add to the list of possible evidence. Oh, a teleporter. I'm gonna need that later. It's not what I was wanting. But it'll have to do for now. I will say, this episode turned out a lot longer than I expected it to be when you said, let's talk about Stoker's history with Wild. This is about a... I, I was expecting it to go pretty long. Because, <laughs> uh... As I, as I sent... When I sent you the notes, there's a lot to say here. Yes, there is. I just, just, uh, I wasn't expecting it. So, I don't really have anything else to add. You've covered this pretty thoroughly. So yeah, I'm sure that some of our watchers probably have opinions of their own on this particular subject. Uh, experiences that they may have to share. things of their own. But, uh... Yeah, that's... basically how things have been running through my head on this subject, and... Uh, take what you will from it. I mean, obviously this is a very inclined reading, and it is perfectly reasonable for people to say nothing in the text explicitly states this, I don't disagree. I don't agree with your interpretation. That's fine. But I think, especially in the current con, uh, the current social climate, this is probably a subject that should be acknowledged when looking at a work like this. Uh, in light of, especially in light of how it affected Stoker himself and the actions he took following Wilde's uh, Wilde's trial and uh, the aftermath thereof. Well, in addition, it's literary analysis. The vast majority of things that we look at with literary analysis can be subtext or even subconscious. It's We don't necessarily know the author's intention, especially if they've been dead for over a century or near it. Well, you pick up on the clues in the text and kind of use that to put together whatever picture you can, and in the case of something that affects like a historical figure, in this case Stoker, you line that you line up what the text says or even implies with the evidence you can find and piece together what seems to be a logical picture from the evidence you've acquired. Yep. So and that's the purpose of literary analysis. <laughs> yep. I am not the first person to think of this, and I will be linking my sources in the comments. Or in the, uh, in the video description, rather. Um, I think I have a solid case. I think that this conclusion was perfectly logical and meets the... It's a reasonable interpretation of the information we have. You may disagree. Uh, if you do, I strongly suggest at least giving some of my sources a look and uh, seeing what you think uh, of their work. Maybe you'll... Maybe you'll think they said it better than I. Maybe you'll still think it's unreasonable. If nothing else, it'll give you something to think about. And that's what we're here to do. As I've said, and so as both of us have said in several episodes prior, um, 
part of what we're doing here is trying to start a conversation. Trying to get people thinking about the stories they read and the books they read. And if you can do that, or if we can do that, rather, mission accomplished. You may not agree with everything we have to say, and that's perfectly fine. We are here to explore the text and the ideas it has to offer and start a discussion. And I'm... I'm interested in the input from anyone who wants to give it. Uh, any closing thoughts? Nope. Then we will, uh... We'll probably wrap this up after the next episode. And that'll be it for Dracula and Castlevania. We'll probably come back to Castlevania next time we do either something uh, in the historical horror type uh, genre. I know Frankenstein is on our list to do in the future, as we mentioned a few episodes ago. Or when we touch on things involving vampires. Uh, like if we ever choose to subject ourselves to Twilight. God's help us. See you next time. Bye.